and I am a breast cancer survivor with no family history. I actually found my own tumor during a self-exam, and I bring that up because I really am a big advocate of being CEO, Chief Empowerment Officer of your health. Uh, when I underwent my double mastectomy uh, with reconstruction and five months of chemotherapy, I made it my goal that I was going to learn from the experience to find out what I could do to treat myself better and take better care of myself. I had been a stressed out business executive running my own public relations agency and definitely had not been taking care of myself, skipping meals, skipping exercise, eating heavy meals too late, running under high level of stress, all the things that we shouldn't be doing as women and men. When I wrote Getting Things Off My Chest, I thought about ways to help people like you make better differences in their lives by taking charge of their health. My message is, while you didn't choose to have cancer, you can choose to take better care of yourself and treat yourself better so you won't have a recurrence and you can live healthy forever. In doing my research, I met Dr. Martha Eddy, founder of Moving for Life, because she's my movement expert in getting things off my chest. We were lucky enough to um, be introduced through SHARE, which is one of the Susan G. Komen New York grantees. Uh, so it's great to um, work with Dr. Eddy, who is, I'm going to say, is Martha, because she has become a friend. And you will hear from her later. Um, but I am going to talk briefly about um, two areas, um, three areas that I use to stay healthy and transform my life. First, I want to just talk about the importance of why you need to take charge of your health during and after cancer. When the treatment ends, your healing journey begins. So if you are undergoing treatment, know that that healing is a journey just as much as the cancer treatment is a journey. And understanding can take time. Many survivors and their loved ones underestimate the amount of time it takes to heal emotionally after treatment. Fact, one in three cancer survivors have physical or emotional issues that put their overall health in jeopardy. This could include worry about a recurrence, insomnia, fatigue, and anxiety about the future and or finances. And let me tell you, I experienced all of them. As we know, cancer is scary, and paying for cancer is also scary. There are also lingering physical effects that could include neuropathy, joint pain, tingling in the breast area, and other physical pain and numbness, or continuing chemo brain, you know, fogginess. I, I get that still sometimes, and we're going to talk about tips to address it. Finally, there's an issue about job security or dissatisfaction. A recent report said that 30% of breast cancer survivors who were employed at time of treatment were unemployed four years later. Women who underwent chemotherapy had a 1.4 times higher um, chance of unemployment. And unfortunately, depression is um, also a common occurrence after cancer treatment. However, uh, now that I've mentioned all those scary things, we're going to talk about ways to take charge so that you will have a better outlook, not only mentally but physically, to deal with these issues. In 2005, the Institute of Medicine recommended that all cancer survivors leave treatment armed with a survivorship plan to cover post-treatment protocols, legal rights, and support services, and nutrition. As I said before, you didn't choose to have cancer but you have many choices on how you want to live your life to stay healthy. And it is your choice to take control and make the changes you need and desire to stay healthy and fulfilled. This is your role as a cancer survivor. If you want to stay healthy, reduce the risk of recurrence or other cancers, and stay healthy overall for you and your family. So make that choice today for a healthier tomorrow. I will tell you, and I write this in Getting Things Off My Chest, I had a mantra. You'll, you'll see that I like to rhyme and alliterate as we go. My mantra to stay healthy was hydrate, gyrate, and masticate, which we're going to dive into. I am a food professional by training. I actually, in my day job, uh, do wine and food events and, and consulting. So I had, a, had to rearrange my relationship with food during and after treatment because I wanted to be healthy. And maintaining a healthy diet during and after treatment is essential. First of all, I don't know um, how many of you are in uh, treatment now, but nutrition management during treatment and after, but especially during, is essential for all cancer management. Poor nutrition 
is indicated in 50 to 80 percent of cancers. Malnutrition is a problem with cancer treatment. Um, you can either be uh, undernourished or, you know, dealing with weight gain due to steroids. So it's very important to maintain a healthy diet. A healthy diet will provide essential nutrients to improve dietary intake, boost the immune system, maintain energy, and help stabilize side effects from treatment, which will help improve your overall quality of health. You must think of food as the fuel you put in your body to stay healthy, and you want good fuel. Also, it's important to maintain a healthy body weight. Note I'm saying healthy, not low, not diet to be thin, healthy body weight for your, your, your shape. Obesity increases the risk of cancer and cancer recurrence. That is a study and a fact. And obesity also contributes to other life-threatening illnesses like heart disease and type 2 diabetes. So whatever you do, a healthy diet is the fuel you put in your body to stay strong. Next slide. Uh, my slide isn't moving yet, but I'm going to tell you that the next slide should say, eat, drink, and move. As I said, I believed in hydrate, gyrate, masticate. It means eat, drink, and move. Those are three things you can do now to stay healthy. So we're going to show you how. I want to first say that when it comes to diet, especially if you are under cancer treatment, that you must discuss with your oncologist and preferably a staff nutritionist at your hospital or treatment center your diet and discuss with them how you can stay healthy through a healthy diet. But don't just start dieting on your own. If you're under treatment, you must discuss your diet and any foods you should avoid due to the medications you're taking because some foods can you know, offset medications. So I am not a registered dietitian or a clinical oncologist, a dietary oncologist, which you should consult with during treatment. I am a health coach. I have been trained as a health coach. And what I'm going to talk about now are simple, practical things you can do at home every day to stay healthy, starting with your diet. So we're going to start with this slide, which is go, what you should do. Because a diet is not about what you shouldn't eat. It's about what you should eat and how you eat. Number one, go green. Eat at least five servings of vegetables and fruit daily. Now, these are facts from you know, the American Cancer Society and Cancer.gov. There's many, many you know, reiteration of this. Very simple. Eat five servings of vegetables and fruit a day. Vegetables are rich in phytochemicals and nutrients to protect your immune system from free radical damage. That's about as scientific as I'm going to get on you. How do you do that? Get one fist, get the other fist, make your portion size on your plate two fists of vegetables or fruit or whole grains, and your protein is one fist. So portion your plate. In fact, the government, um, U.S. government, has a clean plate guidelines that mimic that. Lean. Go lean. This means reduce your intake of trans fats and saturated fats. Now, I want to point out, that fat is essential to a diet. You must have fat in your diet for energy. Fat is energy. It's the type of fat you eat and the quantity you need to watch. And again, quantity is a big issue. With the diet, you can eat whatever you eat most of the time. You just don't want to overeat. So some healthy ways to cook that are you know, better for you versus frying are roasting, baking, poaching, broiling, steaming, or sautéing your food like sautéed vegetables, roasted fish, baked chicken. And when you choose cuts of meat, go lean. Cut the fat off. Ask your butcher to do it. Go lean. Fish is always nice and lean. Organic. Go organic when possible. But if you live somewhere where organic is not readily available or if it is too expensive, for you to buy organic produce, go fresh. Fresh and seasonal. If you live near a farmer's market, you great. Buy the local produce. It's always fresher. If you are in a supermarket, shop the aisles. They say shop the perimeter of the store for the healthiest options and buy um, 
fresh bagged vegetables. There's, there are a lot of great fresh pre-washed vegetables out there. If fresh is not available, fresh frozen is an option. So fresh frozen peas, fresh frozen green beans, they're all better than canned. And they're all better than not having vegetables. Whole grains are important. Whole grains provide fiber and good carbohydrates, healthy carbohydrates. These are um, things like brown rice, amaranth, buckwheat, rolled oats. Um, it's important, though, when you buy breads, whole grain breads, look at the amount of sugar. A lot of packaged foods, again, have a high amount of sugar, which we'll call into. Um, but think brown rice and, and lots of grains. Healthy oils. Um, again, fat is good for you. It's the type of fat you eat. Monounsaturated fat, which is olive oil, for example, is better than partially hydrogenated oils and fats, which you see in packaged foods. Read the labels. Some other uh, oils that are healthy are walnut, grapeseed, and avocado. And I mentioned those. They are rich in um, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, and what's more important, some of them are easier to cook with. Uh, extra virgin olive oil doesn't cook as well. It's better for drizzling, um, whereas uh, grapeseed or canola are good for uh, pan sauteing. I use them regularly. And finally, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, these are uh, very important because they'll actually help boost your mood. Omega-3 fatty acids, um, which are found in many cold water fish, uh, and also healthy oils and flaxseed, um, which is a really great thing to sprinkle on your yogurt and in your dishes. Um, it has been uh, reports say that uh, a diet rich in omega-3 fatty acids will actually help boost your energy, help with mood disorders, and have positive effects against cancer. That's from the American Institute of Cancer Research. So those are one, two, three, four, five, six things you can do now. Next slide. This is the caution. This, this means you don't have to eliminate these foods, but you should watch how you eat them, the portions and the frequency. Sugar. Now, we've all seen reports sugar causes cancer. Sugar does not cause cancer. The result of what, how much sugar you consume could reduce, uh, increase your risk of cancer because you will have gained weight. <laughs> Because if you eat too much sugar, you can gain weight. And sugar is hidden in many foods. Um, but you know, fresh, you know, fresh fruits have sugar in them. So it's natural sugar. So think about the kind of sugar you consume, fresh food, you know, fresh fruit versus packaged foods and candy. Women should have no more than six teaspoons per day. That's 100 calories. Uh, we eat far more than that. It, 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 it's amazing. And this is from the American Heart Association. And we'll provide links. And you'll see we consume like three times out a day. And a lot of it is in the uh, sugary sodas we drink or sugary juices or packaged foods. Read your labels. Try to get your fruit naturally. Next is sodium. Sodium, again, is found in many packaged foods. Uh, you need to try to eat fresh and add your salt versus eat foods that are overly salted. Too much sodium can lead to high blood pressure, risk of heart disease, and stroke. This has to be monitored when you're undergoing cancer treatments because too much sodium is not good for you, but also lodium, lower sodium levels can create an electrolyte imbalance as well, which again, as I said, it's important to try to seek the guidance of a nutritionist, preferably one specializing in, in oncology, to help you. Red meat continues to be an issue as well with cancer. Uh, many people say just eliminate it altogether. Um, it is, a, again, a study by the British Medical Journal that premenopausal women who consume more red meat increase their risk of breast cancer later in life by 22%. That's a pretty big percentage. I will say I gave up red meat during treatment and no longer eat it. I actually, it became because I actually don't like the sight of it. I had a lot of issues with my palate and sense of smell during treatment that to this day affected how I eat. I have another friend who relies on red meat, lean cuts of red meat. She needs it. Her body needs it. So I think the issue is if you're eating red meat, try to eat um, from, you know, red meat that is grass-fed, not feedlot. Uh, know where you're getting your meat from and try to go as healthy and lean as possible and in smaller portions and less frequency. Again, portion and frequency. And also how you cook it, grilled, broiled, simple. 
alcohol, another issue. Um, yes, it's a fact that alcohol increases the risk of breast cancer and other cancers. We also know many of us, particularly women, enjoy our glass of wine, and I am the first to say that, being a wine professional. The rule is, and this again are guidelines for American Cancer Society, limit your consumption to one six-ounce glass of wine per day. Some reports say two, um, and this is preferably after treatment. I will tell you that during treatment, I forewent all alcohol. First of all, the sight and smell of it was disgusting to me, and I don't think it's good for you because it is dehydrating, and when you're going through cancer treatment, you must hydrate. Um, on the flip side, red wine does have resveratrol, which is very good for your heart. So again, caution. So-called health foods, quote, quote, with hidden fat or sugar. This is a lot of this is in um, granola and these health food energy bars, um, juices. Uh, you've got to read the labels. A lot of them pack a lot of carb carbohydrates and sugar and fat. Uh, if possible, go for healthier options like uh, fresh fruit, a handful of nuts, carrots, and hummus, better snacks. Again, I said fat. A little fat is good for you, but watch your trans fats and saturated fats. And finally, nuts. I just mentioned nuts are a great snack. Yeah, they're a great snack. A handful of nuts, maybe 10 nuts, not three handfuls of nuts. Same with nut butters. Peanut butter, if you can do it and don't have allergies, or almond butter is great, but it is high in fat, so keep it small. Small portions limit your portion. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, this really are foods you really should not be eating, so it says stop. Again, the focus is a healthy diet, not a diet. Simple, fresh, flavorful, and balanced. And none of these really are simple, fresh, flavorful, and balanced. Refined, processed foods, artificial ingredients, sugary sodas, salty, sugary snacks caffeinated beverage. Now, I'm going to say a lot of us, including me, like coffee and maybe one cup, but watch your caffeine. First of all, it really can throw you for a loop in terms of, you know, boosted, uh, elevate your energy, and then you have slumps. And it's dehydrating. And again, when you're going through cancer treatment, you've got to stay hydrated. Caffeine dehydrates. Watch your portions. This is a lifestyle management. This isn't the food. This is how much you eat. Don't go back for a second. The tip that I suggest is eat on a smaller plate. Instead of a big dinner plate, get a smaller plate. And don't go back for seconds. That helps. And finally, and very important, and I was guilty of this before my diagnosis, skipping meals. That was probably that and eating very late at night, very rich foods were probably the worst things I did for myself. Skipping meals is bad because if you skip meals, it really plays around with your metabolism and your body can react by going into what they call starvation mode and, and, and you get bloated and you get dizzy and your energy level just drops. Not good. The next point I'm going to bring up is healthy hydration. This is your liquid asset. Healthy hydration, which means drinking water, still or sparkling, herbal teas, no caffeine, fresh fruit, or vegetable juices, or even bouillon regularly will help you flush out toxins, eliminate waste, combat chemo brain, fight dizziness, nausea, and dry skin or mouth. It is so important to stay hydrated, and the recommendation is six, eight ounce glasses of water per day, more if you're undergoing chemo or if you're very, very physically active or working up a sweat. Try to keep water at your desk all the time. Have a glass by your bed, and if for any reason you feel lightheaded, Sit down and get water and get hydrated. Very, very important. And the next is, so that is, okay, that is the feeding yourself for energy part of taking care of yourself. Um, Dr. Martha will talk about movement. But I also want to say that staying healthy is not only about what you eat, managing what you eat. It's also about managing what is eating at you. And I will tell you that stress was a big contributor to my, not, my becoming not well. I was in a state of chronic inflammation and seeing a lot of doctors for other conditions from allergies to itchy skin to panic attacks to indigestion, you name it, before I was diagnosed. And I truly believe all that helped contribute to my diagnosis. So you must manage your stress. And it is very hard when you're undergoing cancer treatment because you're dealing with trying to get healthy, you're dealing with financial issues, you're dealing with caring for your family. Make sure you care for yourself first. 
find out what your stress triggers are. Much in the same way nutritionists recommend to keep a food diary to document what you eat to better manage it, keep an emotions diary to just figure out what is it that's making you happy and what is it that's making you stressed. So you can figure out ways to eliminate or adjust those stress trigger points so you can manage them better. A few tips. If you're feeling overwhelmed or overloaded because you've got a lot on your plate, or a lot on your mind, let some of it go. Learn to prioritize what you need to do today versus what can wait. And ask for help or delegate tasks to people, your family or your work colleagues or even friends. When you are going through cancer, everybody wants to help. Take advantage of it and say, yes, I could use your help doing this errand for me. Help me in this way. Martha will talk more about exercise, but I got to tell you, that was like my number one de-stressor exercise every day. And to this day, when I feel stressed, I go out and take a walk. I also have learned, and I strongly suggest you step away from the computer or your desk, if you work at a computer desk, and take 10-minute stretches. I call them snacker sizes every hour. It will help you unwind and just loosen you up because I think being at a computer and sitting and being sedentary for long periods of time is not healthy for you and very stressful. Reduce your daily to-do list, uh, your checklist, to no more than five things. Uh, I used to have like 20 a day. Every, you know, Life will go on if you don't do everything today. You can do some things tomorrow or the next day or ask people to help you. Be relentless about relaxing. Find downtime and really make it part of your day. You're not being lazy, you're taking care of yourself. Even if it's in the morning, if you just have a little meditation time, or just sit, I, I like to play with my dog. That's my dog time. I have a little evening where we play together and I just don't think about anything else. Accept your limitations. It is okay to be perfectly imperfect. And when you're going through cancer, and when you've survived cancer, you've realized that your body has taken a major hit and you realize it's not perfect. You realize your body was not perfect and you had to fix it and get well. And from that point on, whether you've had a mastectomy or a lumpectomy, whatever's happened to you, accept your new body and appreciate that it is living and that you have, may have limitations and that's perfectly okay. And whatever you do, do not compare what you went through and where you are to what somebody else is going through or doing. It's your life and it's, it's, it's all you have to think about. Find a creative outlet something that brings you joy so that you're not focusing on work or health or responsibilities. Find something that gives you pleasure. I turned to writing. I wrote during treatment. Unfortunately, my father passed away from cancer just before I started chemotherapy. Writing was how I expressed my grief, my joy, and everything. It was my diary. It was my safe place to go. So find your safe place in a creative outlet. And understand that everything I'm telling you is perfectly okay. You're not being, being selfish does not mean you're, it's bad. It means you're taking care of yourself. That's what being selfish is. You're making your health and well-being a priority. And knowing that will help you de-stress. Next slide. All right, I am going to hand the platform over to Dr. Martha Eddy, who is going to talk about something that I think is just the best way to manage your weight, your well-being, and your stress, which is movement. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Melanie, and thank you for so much of what you shared. Every little bit of it is priceless information. I actually began studying holistic health in the early 1980s, and you basically have encapsulated everything that goes towards a holistic lifestyle and a healthy lifestyle in this short amount of time. So everybody take heed, and thank you uh, to the Komen Center in New York City for making this possible for both of us to share our bits of wisdom. So I'm going to be talking about movement and uh, in particular how I came to develop something called Moving for Life. A few of you or some of you may have heard of my work as Moving On from Cancer or Moving On Aerobics, which was our original name. And I'll talk about why aerobics are so important, why we put that in the name. 
um, the story is different than Melanie's. Basically, I was surrounded with friends and friends of friends with breast cancer and had just lost my own mother to cancer and was approached to develop an exercise program for women with breast cancer in particular back in 1999. And I was drawn to do it as a way to give back because my mother had loved to move and kind of complained about the fact that she hadn't kept moving. She'd been an athlete and uh, she did switch to doing yoga in the 1980s and some dancing, but um, she would have loved to have done more. So it's been a great pleasure to use my expertise as a dance educator. I've taught at Columbia for many years and as a, an exercise physiologist to pull this program together. And I'll be speaking about exercise in general and all the things you can do for yourselves. Um, but I want to tell a little story about my dear friend, Allison Rosen, who approached me in 1999 through her friend, Jan Albert because Annie is her nickname. Annie was um, home. She'd already been cured. She'd had her chemo, radiation, and surgery, but she wasn't feeling well. And that went on for some days, and she was kind of spinning into a depression. And she knew she had to get out of it because her family depended on her getting back to work. So the way the story goes is one day, as a couch potato, not feeling very well, she used her remote control and was flipping through the channels on TV, and there was Richard Simmons. And I think she liked the music he had on. So she stood up, and she started not doing what they were doing because it really didn't look like something she wanted to do, but swaying to the music and beginning to move to the music and kind of playing with some of the ideas that he was working with. And after that, being the avid researcher that she is, she's got her doctorate in psychology and is a very uh, learned person and research-oriented person, the first thing she did was check out music and found out that it truly is a, an, an antidote to depression. Really important that we surround ourselves with good music. And then she looked into exercise. And there weren't a lot of studies, but she did find a few that showed that exercise was important to do uh, as part of cancer recovery. And I hesitated because at that time, that was about all that the research showed. And there weren't that many studies. But they were enough to uh, whet her interest. So she sought out someone who might have the expertise to design a really careful and scientific exercise program. But she also had the vision that this exercise program be made a video or a DVD. And so she found her friend Jan Albert, who is an award-winning video maker and television documentarian. And together, the three of us crafted this idea of a special program for women with cancer. So I'm going to now talk to the different slides uh, about different aspects of how movement can be helpful. Now, generally, when we think of exercise, we think of kind of getting sweaty, kind of bringing our bodies to new limits. But I'm going to be speaking also about movement in general, that our bodies are designed with joints and muscles so that we move. And as many of you know, lifestyle has become very sedentary. We sit at our desks. We sit in our cars. We sit at the table. And we sit and watch television for entertainment or even at the theater. So movement is getting lost. So one of the very first things, as Melanie was talking about, is that if we're just feeling stressed, it's important that we just get our bodies moving again. There's something called endorphins. It's a hormonal shift that happens when we're listening to music or just moving, running, uh, usually moving fairly rigorously. And that is relative. That kind of rigor is dependent on whatever kind of gets your heart rate up. So if it's just raising your hand in the air and doing the wave 10 times, that's rigorous. We often think about meditation as a key to relaxing. And I want to just make it clear that relaxation can come either from meditation or from movement itself. I did some research in 1985 when I was a student at Columbia comparing the use of either exercise 
and different types of exercise actually, or meditation for reducing blood pressure, which is a big indicator of stress, along with cortisols that you can um, find in your mouth in particular. And what I found was that some people did really well in reducing their blood pressure, both uh, short term and over time, by meditating every day. And other people actually didn't do well with meditation, but if they exercise, that brought their blood pressure down. However, there are different types of exercise that are helpful with this. If you're tense while you're exercising, that's not going to reduce your stress level. And if you're squeezing your hand, like in tennis, you have to be a little careful. So if you're tending towards a lot of stress, you might want to find movement that's more fluid, that's less uh, muscularly gripped, if you will, or tight. So again, everyone benefits from exercise. And most people really do benefit from some sort of meditative practice. It could be simply listening to music. But you will know if you tend towards one or the other. I want you to think about that. Which one are you? Do you need to move to relax, or do you need to really rest? So as we go on to look at how movement can be a de-stressor, the next question is, what kind of movement? There's so many options out there. You might just like to put on music in your house and move. You might rather be with another person and dance or in a class. For sure, the getting sweaty part is pretty important. And I'm going to talk more about the physiology of that in a bit. But just for de-stressing, that sense of just really expending energy and what we call shifting your mind state is really important. So a fast walk, a run, or a bike ride can be terrific if you're up for that. Dance classes are great for many reasons. And the point I'm making here about stress is that if you're learning something new, it requires you to be pretty fully present, especially if it involves your body, and especially if you're avoiding stepping on other people's toes. So ballroom dancing or Zumba or any kind of learning of movement, it might be Tai Chi uh, sequences, will help bring your mind into a new place. So that's the process of learning new steps. It can also be very nice to go to a yoga class if you're inclined toward the, that kind of deep stretching. Um, and you'll find within the more meditative yoga classes that there are periods of either chanting, toning with the voice, or meditation. And you can learn to meditate in those classes, following your breath, following a certain chant. And that's really helpful for calming the mind. As I mentioned before, Tai Chi and Qi Kong are types of movement that relax us. And they're even considered movement meditations. Relative to movement meditation is also a whole new field called somatic awareness. The soma is the living body. It's just a Greek word. If you go to Greece, uh, the country, there's the term body, which we have a body when we're alive, but we also have a body when we die. But the soma is only existent while we're alive. So somatic awareness is this idea of being aware of our aliveness and actually being aware of the sensations of our body. This is another way to talk about the body-mind connection. So our body begins to tell us, oh, we're under stress. I feel my voice quivering, or I feel uh, my stomach churning, or I feel sweaty in my palms. These are all indicators that are here for us to listen to. Or even just that my shoulders are tense, or that I'm getting antsy and I need to get up and move. So somatic awareness is paying attention to your body, even throughout the day. And the list here of Feldenkrais has a class called Awareness Through Movement. Moshe Feldenkrais, Milton Traeger created Mentastic, so the idea of exercising the mind. Body-mind dancing is my own dance method that is using principles from body-mind centering. And the Alexander Technique is fantastic. It's one of the earliest most renowned form of somatic awareness that many, many actors and vocalists and instrumentalists use. So you can look these up if you, you think the idea of kind of maybe 
lying down, moving slowly, gaining more proprioceptive awareness, awareness of your body could be helpful to you. All right, so now we're going to talk about how movement is specifically helpful to cancer patients and also um, people that are survivors. In particular, Melanie had talked about the lingering physical effects of cancer treatment and that they can include neuropathy, joint pain, tingling in the breast area, physical pain and numbness in the treated area. So when Annie Rosen, Dr. Allison Rosen, told me about her experience, she sat me down and said, these are the things I went through. I had fire feet. My feet just hurt so much. And I had so much joint pain that I didn't want to do yoga because I didn't want to get up and down from the floor. And uh, in her case, she had some loss of range of motion, a tiny bit of lymphedema. She certainly knew of her colleagues that had experienced lymphedema and was concerned about weight changes as well. So as I designed Moving for Life, I tried to approach each of these symptoms as systematically as possible, bringing in movement to help um, soften the impact of what the chemotherapy and radiation in particular had done and also what surgery had done. I also list here mental confusion and with that there can also be change of body image and also fatigue. So these are all big concerns and different types of movement address these. Our next slide is going to talk about um, the types of movement that are out there. So we've, we've said a little bit about how there are different kinds of movement for stress and here's for stress and fitness. Yoga, cardio, which is an aerobic, cardiovascular work. Training, meaning like personal training in the gym, working with weight training in particular. Tai Chi or Qi Kung, which are ongoing kind of movement meditations. There's dance. There's walking, really important. That's really the number one go-to exercise. Melanie just talked about it. When she needs to just shift her state of mind, she'll get outside and walk. And the getting outside is an important piece, too, because there are more and more, seems like common sense, but we also have studies now that show that nature is so important, not only to oxygenation, but also to the experience of just kind of letting go and looking at the wonder of life. Biking can be great if you're up for it, and that can be a stationary bike or a regular bicycle. And jogging, but I only recommend jogging if you know that you have very resilient joints and you've got good shoes and good ground to work with. So um, be careful, especially if you have any kind of um, impact injury already. You don't want to exacerbate that. So again, Moving for Life is a type of wellness programming that helps you select which of these movements are best for your personal goals. Are you trying to mostly relax? Or are you working towards um, more range of motion? Or are you trying to lose weight? So we're going to talk about each of those right now. But before we do any of this, we're going to get back to that somatic awareness idea, this self-awareness piece. And the reason I bring it up is especially if exercise is new for you, but really for everybody, the way to avoid injury is to stay aware of your own experience while you're trying this new movement. And I bring this up because as a movement therapist, my private practice is working with lots of people with injuries, as well as people with strokes and other kinds of movement impairments. Um, and I can't tell you how many people come to me after being in a yoga class and kind of going just a little too far. So especially in yoga where you can slow down, it's a great time to only do what feels right in your body where there's no sharp pain. If there is any kind of sensation that's unusual, sure, you might have a kind of stretch that you've never felt before and you need to breathe into it. But if it's sharp and if it's hot, then please way back off because that's not healthy. Okay, so again, moving for life emphasizes self-awareness, this somatic education idea, and that the reason we do that is when you're in touch with your body signals, you're less likely to get injured, so you're staying safe. You're more likely to pace yourself. So 
so that you're, if you have fatigue already or if exercise is causing fatigue, you'll find the right amount that actually gives you energy back. So if your workout is just exhausting you, it's not the right workout. You should feel energized later in the day. You should sleep better at night. And also, exercise, if you're doing something that you don't enjoy, it's getting you frustrated, it feels too hard, that's not the right exercise either. So being aware of your emotions, like Melanie talked about, keeping that emotional diary, well, I'm kind of asking you to do that while you're exercising. Does this feel fun? Is it feeling like something I'm motivated to return to? Am I getting energized and do I feel safe? And partly that's going to be who your teacher is too. You want to feel these pieces if you're in a class. These factors should show up from your instructor. So the true goal of movement, of course, is to improve your health. We've talked about that. But it's also to experience pleasure and joy. So we want you to select different kinds of movement activities and workouts that you really love. Now, as I promised, um, when we're speaking about the cancer experience, we get even more specific. So I had mentioned that cardio work or cardio workout uh, is an aerobic workout. What does that mean? It means that you're actually, um, in a way, stressing, because stress, a little bit of stress is what we need to get stronger. Too much stress actually weakens us, especially when it's repeated over time. So with aerobics, you're stressing your cells, the ability to extract energy, that sugar that if we eat the right amount of, actually every food we eat breaks down to sugar. So we really don't need to eat any sugar, but it's in fruit and other things. So of course, it's part of the pleasure of life to enjoy it. Um, but we're going to take that sugar and use it to fire our muscles and get our bodies moving. It's this efficiency at the cellular level that aerobic activity really works on. So your cellular health gets better and your fatigue levels go down when you get sweaty. So aerobic activity is prolonged, rhythmic, whole body movement that um, usually causes you to sweat a little bit unless you're the type of person that just doesn't sweat. Aerobic activity is also the number one way to lose weight. Now, obviously, food is really important, and I really salute Melanie in talking about portion control. So we're not getting into wild diets unless for some reason you need to. But mostly, we're focusing on just having enough good food, that good fuel she talked about. Um, and then the aerobic activity is the way to then burn calories, as you well know. So we take calories in through food, and we burn them through movement. Even just being standing burns a lot more calories than being sitting. Okay, Cardiovascular health is also important in general because we need to really protect our hearts. And um, it's the number one cause of mortality is really the morbidity rate is based in, in what's going on with the heart as well as with cancer. So we want to keep all parts of our beings, our cells, healthy and strong, and our heart healthy and strong. Now we're going to look at some other types of exercise. Why would we stretch? Well, there are lots of reasons to stretch. We all should be stretching. Again, if we're sitting in a static position, then our body is not getting the natural swaying that happens, for instance, with walking, where your arms just naturally swing, your legs just naturally swing. Um, we're not chopping wood. We're not climbing trees as much as we used to. So with that, um, our body just tends to almost cramp up to an extreme. And that would be an extreme. But all the muscles are shortening and tightening. And so um, it is important to stretch if we're not getting kind of good, fluid, rhythmic movement going during the day. Then it's even more important post-surgically because scar tissue will build up. So if we can keep movement going, we can get our full range of motion back. In particular, it's usually the shoulder region that's compromised and the armpit region and areas in the chest. So for instance, in Moving for Life, we really focus on movement through the rib cage as well as the arm itself and looking at how the shoulder blade needs to be moving. So stretching can be any kind of stretching. As I've just said, in 
kind of the good old days, stretching happened as, an, as a matter of course by just doing a lot of different types of movement during the day. When I talk about fluid movement, I'm referring to swinging and swaying more than static stretching. And that's sometimes referred to as dynamic stretching. Stretching is important, and especially for those of us that live in the cities, our calf muscles, our lower legs are so tight, walking on concrete. And for women in heels, that's even worse. So we need to take breaks to just do runner stretches. I am not a big proponent of stretching before your workout. I prefer that you do a gentle warm-up that's either, again, swinging and swaying or just walking. And then save your stretching once your body is warm. Now, if you're already, it's a hot summer day and you're already um, warm enough, then you might stretch a little bit in your apartment before you go out or on a park bench before you begin. Um, but the deep stretching should definitely happen when your body temperature is higher. Yoga is a great choice. It's available now. Uh, when I started doing yoga in 1975, I was just so blessed that there happened to be a class in a small town in Massachusetts, and I'm thankful for that. And now everybody really has access. And what's nice is that cancer survivors have access to free classes throughout at least the greater New York region. And I think more and more uh, yoga centers are wanting to give back. And certainly this is something you could even ask a yoga center near you. Would you consider doing a free class or have, uh, for cancer survivors or having a scholarship for people that are already dealing with the expense of being um, hospitalized or having an illness. So again, prior to yoga's popularity, stretching came kind of as a normal runner stretch. That was happening in the 70s. And then prior to that, it was just more movement. What's great about yoga is it combines stretching and deep relaxation. And so if you feel that's what you need, it's a great choice. Again, you're going to find a teacher that you trust, that motivates you, and that you feel safe with. There are other mind-body disciplines that we already referred to, with the somatic education, that are a little easier on the body than yoga. If you're finding yoga difficult or you can't find a yoga class specifically for cancer uh, recovery, then go ahead and look into these others that are really all over the world. And you never know what might be in your neighborhood. So I'll say them again. Uh, these somatic education classes often start with exercises on the floor or private sessions where you get to lie on a table and then you begin to gradually move different parts of your body until everything's moving smoothly and you're really working with this body-mind connection. Alexander technique, body-mind centering, continuum, which is a nice wave-like movement, dynamic embodiment, Feldenkrais. You can read this list. These are all available to you. Kinetic awareness works with rolling on balls. So if you've got muscle tightness, many of you may see these balls in the gym. We're talking about the smaller balls in this case. The larger physio balls are used by almost all of these different methods. We were really among the first to use them. And now the physio physical therapists are using them too, which is great. And um, there's Rolf and Traeger as well. Okay. So speaking of, in this next slide, um, we're speaking of your physical therapist. If your insurance did pay for some physical therapy, they probably gave you a series of exercises. And I hope that um, you can continue with any of those. You may be ready to move on. But most exercises are really uh, basic and important to do every day or every other day even if um, you're ready to layer on additional exercises. And yoga therapists, movement therapists, somatic educators can also guide you. Certain wellness coaches with a movement background can guide you with stretching. Or you can simply kind of follow your own body. Pay attention. Try just elongating your joints, stretching them out, moving, and breathing deeply, and holding your position for 20 or 30 seconds. You need to overcome what's called the stretch reflex to really lengthen the muscle. If you first just kind of pull, and there used to be an old, uh, a way of getting ready for gym in gym class. When we were younger, um, in the 60s and 70s, 
there was a lot of bouncing. Well, bouncing just actually tightens up your body. It can loosen up your joints a little bit, but the muscles tighten. So that's what's so great. Yoga is 5,000 years old, and it was determined a long time ago that uh, the physical part of yoga has really been enhanced in the last 200 years, uh, that taking time and staying in a pose for a long time, for this 20 or 30 second period, is what's going to lengthen the muscle. So again, you can always go back to gentle swing and swinging and putting on music and dancing. Finally, um, if you're interested in moving for life classes, I'll talk more about this. We integrate body awareness, that's the somatic body-mind connection, breath activation so that you're inhaling and exhaling and not holding your breath, swaying, some gentle yoga poses, and easy stretching together with the aerobic workout. And um, we do have a DVD, so wherever you are in the country or world, we have an English and a Spanish version of the Dance to Recovery DVD that puts all this together. Okay. Now there are some other components about movement that will be shown in this next slide. Yep. So joint pain and numbness. Melanie uh, was talking, sharing about her experience earlier before, as we were preparing this talk. And Annie, as I said, uh, Allison Rosen talked about fire feet and um, uh, tingling. So neuropathy is that experience of either burning or numbness. It can go to either extreme. What we do in Moving for Life, and so you can look for this amongst any of your teachers or create exercises of your own, is to put pressure through the area. I learned this actually when I first started working with people with Parkinson's disease, that um, kind of one way to steady the tremor is to place weight on, uh, for instance, your hand on a table. And you can try this right now if you're at home by a desk or a table. Just let your fingers slowly at the fingertips, then the whole finger, then the palm of the hand press there and just kind of rest. It's also the process of feeling different um, tactile uh, uh, stimuli. So specifically what I'm trying to say is let's say you had a shoe box and you filled it with rice. If you could just move your feet or your hands through that, and you'll find this in an occupational therapist's office, then you can wake up the nerves again. Melanie talked about fat and how important fat is. It stores energy, but also the fat um, calms and, and protects the nerves and the organs and the glands. So one of the things we're doing is kind of calming down the nervous system by moving more slowly and using deep pressure. This is also important with children with autism, so I could go on another spin about that some other day. Uh, with joint pain, in particular, a little different than the nerve pain, so where the joints themselves are sore and achy, uh, it's important to have correct alignment. So pre or post cancer, it's very possible joint pain was caused because or well, knock kneed or pigeon toed or uh, flat arches or rolling in at the ankles. So these kinds of uh, alignment issues need to be addressed just to help. Also, if there's a lot of weight on the body, that puts pressure on the leg uh, joints. So one of the things I mentioned here is circling. 90% of the joints of the body are elliptical in shape, and much of the movement we do that's prescribed in the gym these days, fitness, is more two-dimensional. So you're just going kind of forward and back or side to side, but you're not circling. So if you can add a little circumduction, circling to your day, that can be very nice for your joints. And there are specific things you can do for the feet, for the knee, for the hip, and obviously for the hand and elbow and shoulder. Warm water and even circling or shaking a little bit in warm water can be great. Uh, the JCC of Manhattan has a wonderful water free aerobics class in water, water exercise for people with cancer. And I highly recommend that if you have access to it. Or warm baths if you like them. Um, meditation and mindful movement for pain control is really important. So there we're back to the Tai Chi-like movement, the somatic education type movement, or doing meditation where you're no longer in your body, but you're kind of going into the deeper part of your being 
and just learning to separate a little from the pain. So we can actually control through the mind. That's more like mind-body connection. And then other days, we'll want to be more working with the body leading the mind. So you have these choices. Again, there are many free programs, uh, and it's worth Googling them. Uh, there's freebies.com that lists various uh, free items, most the nationally, so that's a great one. And we are going to give you some resources at the end as well of this slideshow. So our next type of movement is um, looking at weight maintenance. So that I mentioned that joints are going to be protected by not being too heavy as well. But even more important for a cancer survivor, talking about all the fears and uh, tribulations that, that Melanie was referring to, is this notion that fat is a place where hormonal storage is happening as well. And so estrogen, progesterone, the balance of the hormones is very much controlled by fat stores. And because of that, it's been found that if we can reduce the amount of fat in the body to a healthy amount so that the body mass index is at your in a proper marker for your height, then um, you can reduce your chance of a breast cancer recurrence by 26 to 40 percent. So that's information to share with people that you know. And um, it's also great, we're talking about the aerobic activity being so important in shifting this body mass index. So finding, again, partners and people that you will walk with, uh, whatever it takes for you to get out there and exercise. This is a lifestyle intervention. So food and exercise are just really important. And it's particularly important in overweight women because there's an increased risk of breast cancer and compared to non-overweight women. Moving for Life is a unique exercise program for breast cancer, as we've talked about. And the goal of the program is to incorporate a safe and effective workout through low-impact aerobic exercise. But we also combine it with strengthening, flexibility, and talking, really sharing what our, what our experiences are. Low-impact aerobics means not really jumping. So again, if you already have joint issues, whether it's the neuropathy or joint pain, it could be from the hormonal therapies, uh, it's really important to find a way to get aerobic and sweaty without doing a lot of up and down, off the floor jumping. So if you like Zumba and it feels good, go for it. But if you're looking for something that protects you, it's more important to find a non-impact class. All right, we're going to wrap it up pretty quickly. This is showing the results of our study at NYU where we um, had Moving for Life twice a week for eight weeks. And with that, we were able to uh, have everybody in the group lose at least five pounds, and the mean was a 10-pound loss in just eight weeks. So that's a significant uh, statistical shift. We're very proud of it. It's been published uh, with the various oncological societies, as well as in the Journal of Cancer Therapy. OK. Next, we're going to talk about the kind of exercise with the next slide, please, that um, we we'll talk. There we go. Um, this is about the study. We can move a little further. But what I wanted to say is that enjoyment is a key factor. And what we found is lots of women really do enjoy dancing with other people or dancing in general. So that's what's fun about moving for life. So you can get sweaty going out running alone. And if you like that, great. But if you're a social person and you want to be in a group, then it's wonderful to come to a class and enjoy that camaraderie. If you'd rather, if you like the music and you like the dancing, but you'd rather be alone, that's one of the primary um, benefits of the DVD is that you have the privacy of your own home to work out in. Um, what we did find, though, is that for those people that are more social and like classes, when they stopped the class, they didn't necessarily keep up. And so we want to really encourage you to find what works for you and what's exciting to do, what's fun to do, and keep doing it over time. Okay? So it's 
not about just a few weeks and then stopping. It's about making it a big lifestyle change so that exercise 150 minutes a week of aerobic activity um, is just part of life. That helps in the prevention of cancer. It helps in the recovery from cancer. We now know that it helps in reducing uh, the levels of fat and therefore the recurrence of cancer and it also can help extend life longevity. All right, next slide, please. Moving along, um, we've talked a few times about the stress, and it's hard to know whether the mental confusion that comes, uh, that people describe, some people refer to it as chemo brain, some people find that not really fair, um, some people like it, some people don't, but in any case, if you're feeling confused, it can also be related to feeling a little dizzy or tired. There can be the component of are you eating healthy foods, that good fuel that really gives you back what you need. Are you hydrating enough, as Melanie talked about? Um, and or are you getting enough exercise that both gets your oxygen throughout your whole body to the cells and to your brain? Or are you stimulating your brain enough? And so dance is great because you're learning new kind of steps. Even though in our case it's sort of just following along, it still gets uh, that body-mind connection going. All right, next slide, please. I'm going to try to finish up in the next few minutes. So it's great that uh, here in the greater New York area we're able to talk about quite a few free and low cost classes. At the JCC of Manhattan, there's a whole suite of different types of cancer recovery classes. There's yoga, there's the water aerobics I talked about, there's Moving for Life, there's a NIA class. Similarly, at Gilda's Club, Moving for Life is there. It's called Gentle Aerobics. It's open to men and women, people with any type of cancer, and basically there are many, many other great classes at Gilda's Club on Houston Street in Manhattan. Uptown in Harlem, Emblem Health, the insurance company now has a neighborhood center and those classes are open to anyone. So you can come with your caregiver, you can come with your friend. Uh, people are coming who have diabetes to the Moving for Life classes. There's a nutrition class beforehand and it's all online. You can look up the, the huge listing of free classes given by Emblem Health. Share support groups, can share cancer support. Uh, is one of our major partners and they have support groups throughout the greater New York area and they often bring in Moving for Life to both share this kind of information. Uh, so we have to do sort of three levels of wellness programming. There's a lecture sharing in either English or Spanish this information that I've shared with you today. There's also a chance for questions and answers and really looking at movement and how to devise exercises personally for each person around their specific pains and aches and pains or, or uh, fitness goals. And then thirdly, we actually do the class in many of the share support group sites. Um, we were a, uh, a Susan G. Komen of Greater New York City um, recipient, grant recipient, and I have to say that that launched us from being a small volunteer organization that really no one had heard of, <laughs> um, maybe just here in New York, to becoming uh, more widely known in hospitals throughout the whole New York area. And now, as you see in this list below, we have classes in Cincinnati, the Bay Area, New Jersey, Vancouver, and around uh, in Asia and in Europe. So the other thing is we just taught some Moving for Life yoga classes, which again are very sensitive yoga classes specifically for breast cancer survivors. So all of these are possible. I hope you will look them up. You're going to see more resources soon. And again, a reminder that there is a DVD for those of you that don't have access to a class or that just would rather exercise at home. Okay. So we're going to go Martha. back. Thank you very much. Um, I hope this has been very helpful for you. It's a lot of information. Uh, when I was going through uh, treatment, I started doing fun things like rhyming games to keep my brain on target and alliteration. So I'm going to end this. Uh, we're going to summarize. Martha and I are going to summarize simple steps for smart survivor tips. And here they go. Hydrate, healthy hydration. Gyrate, get daily exercise and movement, as Martha outlined. Masticate, this means maintain a healthy, balanced diet and chew your food with mindfulness. 
Be careful about your diet. Meditate. Find a way to relax your body and clear your mental debris and de-stress. Stimulate. Find a creative outlet that brings you joy and reattaches to your senses. Eliminate. Learn to release anger, worry, fear, and shame. There's nothing to be ashamed about with cancer. Walk away from toxic people and situations if you can. Delegate. Don't try to do everything yourself. Ask for help. Assign chores and tasks to others. It's not a sign of weakness. It's really a sign of strength. And finally, appreciate. Express gratitude for the life you have and the life you are recapturing after cancer and share that feeling with others. You have a team of people who care for you during cancer. Make sure they are thanked as well because they lived it with you and you'll only feel happier in the process. Uh, Martha and I have outlined a few of uh, many. Uh, we try to you know, make them simple for you, helpful resources. They're up on the screen. Um, we selected them because they provided specific information to support what we've talked about today, American Institute for Cancer Research, American Cancer Society, Environmental Working Group. Uh, the Shopper's Guide has something called the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. Those are the Dirty Dozen or um, fruits and vegetables most likely to have toxic pesticide residue on them. Very helpful for shopping. The Monterey Bay Seafood Watch, Seafood Choices, um, tells you about which food, uh, which seafood are better to eat, which to avoid, and which to proceed with caution based on overfishing or potential toxicity due to mercury. Uh, of course, Komen. Uh, National has a wonderful, um, wonderful information. Uh, this one uh, talks about exercise, Martha's own program, movingforlife.org, and of course, Susan G. Komen, Greater New York, great resource. Um, you don't need to get too lost in the internet. These are some to help you. Most important, just focus on what you want to do and discuss it with your physician and make sure that whatever you do is for your own bio of individuality. Do the exercise that works for you, eat what works for you, and always watch your stress. Thank you, Melanie. That was a great... Yeah, I think we have one last, and in summary, just Make sure you know who we are. Um, these are photos of my book, Getting Things Off My Chest, The Survivor's Guide to Staying Fearless and Fabulous, and my new book coming out uh, in two weeks, Fearless, Fabulous You, Lessons for Living Life on Your Terms, and of course, the uh, Moving for Life Dance to Recovery video. All of these are available on Amazon.com, and I know mine are on Barnes & Noble. I'm, I don't know if it's Moving for Life on Barnes & Noble or just Amazon. It isn't, but you can also get it at the Moving for Life. Um, Helpful resources. To you, help you can order. You I wanted to also day. Amazon.com also now has Amazon Smile, and Moving for Life is a nonprofit, mm -hmm. so I'm sure you can choose to um, use Amazon Smile for any of your favorite nonprofits as well. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I think we hopefully have some time. Are there any questions? I think we're taking them. Or no, I don't know. We're not tech people. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there is a question from Mora. And uh -huh. if one of you ladies can go oh, yeah. to your your screen, you should be able to see it. Unfortunately, at the moment, I cannot see it. Oh, question from Mora. There is a question from Mora. Okay. Um, it should. I, I see cannot question. see it, unfortunately. Yeah, I can't see a question. It just says there is one. Mine doesn't show a question at all. Oh, Mora. I don't know can what your question tell is. Questions? Mora, if you can, if you can put it in the chat section. Um, maybe we can see the question if you're still there and still have a question. Well, I just want to say um, regarding your movement uh, talk, Martha, it is important to find the movement that works for you and also to keep it fun, mix it around if you can. I do yoga, I do Pilates, I dance, and I do a little bit of strength. And I think that keeping it you know, mix and diversified is as similar as keeping your diet diversified so you're not eating, you know, um, cauliflower every day. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's another way to keep the joints from getting injured. So again, getting yeah. a different types of movement will also get you into different ranges of motion, what we call directions in space. So yeah. some things have you moving backwards and some have you moving forward and some mm -hmm. around in circles and some with people and some alone. So they all really meet different needs. Yes, very did. much so. And I know that for me, it was very hard to use my arms for, oh gosh, over a year. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And I credit, and I talk about it again, I talk about Pilates really made a huge difference. Um, ironically, because I couldn't use my arms, my core got very strong. Yeah, that'll <laughs> Because happen. I had to get up using my stomach muscles. Huh? That's one of the things we talk about a lot in Moving for Life as we're exercising, that really all movement comes from the core, and we want to kind of relax those tense shoulders. Everybody's been overusing their shoulders, mm -hmm. especially in front of screens, uh, whether they're TV or computer screens. Right. And so we're moving uh, the shoulders back and down. And as you even said when you came to the Moving for Life class, it, it's great. Once you've got your range of motion back, we still need this shoulder work because of all the sitting and, and table work that we do. Yeah, you use, you use bands, which I keep yeah. um, in my uh, bedroom and watch TV. I'll sit in front of the TV and just do work with my, with the strut, the Dyna bands, and it really opens up. Um, even today, I mean, my diagnosis was five years ago. Even mm. today, I have constant, I have scar tissue and tightness, and I have to constantly keep moving my shoulders. It's I so doesn't help being on the computer and writing as well, but that is something that I'm, I may have to live with the rest of my life, and I've accepted it. But it's it's as long as I exercise, it's fine. Well, I also contracted Lyme disease and had it for many years without knowing it. Uh, I think my symptoms were kind of confused with menopausal symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so when it was finally diagnosed, things got a lot better. But I, too, have to really move my joints. I have to eat a very clean diet. Mm -hmm. And um, this, this diversification, I was just saying, the way you've talked about and the way the government is talking now about portion control, I was often told in the, back in the 80s in our holistic nutrition classes, 80% of your plate should be vegetables. Exactly. And um, basically, maybe we can think about exercise the same way, that you, you don't want to just run. You want to have some walking, some running, some change right. of level, some movement to music. So kind of making sure you have a diverse diet is a great way. A diverse diet of food and a diverse diet of exercise is a great way of thinking about things. Exactly. Thank you for that, Melanie. Exactly. Right. So, Vern, do we have any other questions? Um, I, I never heard from. We never heard from Maura. Well, unfortunately, I, I cannot access the questions. Um, mm -hmm. We will do better in the next webinar when now that we have uh, we understand some of the challenges of this particular software. Yeah. Um, but if there are other questions, I will try to retrieve them from the system, and I'll send an email to to the people with the questions um, with uh, with responses from the two of you. All but right. for now, I want to say thank you to both Martha and Melanie for being with us today. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, you, the two of you presented a tremendous amount of information. And uh, I know that everyone is, is grateful for that. I also want to say that, uh, again, if the technology gods are with us, um, this webinar has been recorded. So as soon as there's a link to the webinar, we will get it out to everybody, um, including the people who weren't able to be with us today. So thank you all very much, and have a great evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you, and you, everybody out there, we hope to see you sometime in person, and hopefully you'll share this information with others. And we you, really appreciate your taking the time to be with us today. Yeah, and stay fabulous. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye and all. Bye.